So this talk will be about, uh, so the med medical schools first, so basically their AI programs and kind of how everything is coming along, and then it'll switch into quantum uh, with medical images and kind of like the basics leading up to where to go next with algorithms. So it's good to see everybody on. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Kochak. I'm the founder and CEO of Chemical Q Device. This is discussion 118, Thursday, January 18th, uh, 2024, for quantum machine learning algorithms for medical school research. So what I want to start off with here is basically with Stanford Medicine is um, in conjunction with this uh, human-centered artificial intelligence, they say most private AI investments were for medical and healthcare out of everything. You know, so in specific for private investments, and you'll see in this chart in the upper right hand corner with the U.S., these are in billions of dollars, um, a little bit less for, for 2022 than for 2021. Uh, so you'll see, you know, U.S. and private investments ahead of China, and that's uh, Europe and U.K. as well there, too. And then, um, so basically they have, and they're likely doing a lot more than just what's shown on the screen. So uh, there's an AI model that identified patients with clinical deterioration. And this was done um, to get a 20% reduction in the clinical deterioration events. And there was a survey of uh, almost 97% of the nursing staff felt that the AI workflow was, uh, was adding to patient uh, care of the approximately 57% of those uh, attendees, which is good. And most of you know, so we're, when we're talking about generative AI, this includes chat GPT. So it's chat uh, generative pre-trained uh, models. Uh, they asked it, so these Cleveland Clinic and Stanford researchers asked ChatGPT 25 different questions on heart disease uh, prevention, and, and ChatGPT a answered it correctly with 21 of 25. So, you know, the goal with all this is moving towards, you know, the data sets just being strictly medical. And there's actually, there was a talk by a previous, um, a prior FDA commissioner with this too, basically saying that they want to switch to large language models, you know, have, um, you know, at the bare minimum, you know, pre-screen pre calls, you know, patients calling in to get most effective, you know, placing of where they actually should go. And then this next one. So if you're if you don't know much about Berkeley, they do a lot of innovative stuff. So in 2021, Project Jupiter. So I know most of you that code here have used a Jupiter Lab or Jupiter Notebook. Um, so they're saying this is you know it's computer code that transforms science uh, using these. They're open source. Uh, sometimes you have to get it through Anaconda, something like that. And actually, I think with Kiskits, Kiskits actually built in with Jupyter, Kiskit Lab is Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebooks. And what they want to do next is basically with uh, Jupyter Health to present broader opportunities to revolutionize healthcare uh, systems to patients. And, you know, this is opening up a, a, whole, a huge door, you know, for AI because it's become not only are there, you know, so last year there were over 500 FDA approved AI algorithms. And then I think you can tack on another 170 from the last October. So we're looking at like at least six or 700 FDA approved algorithms. Obviously the newer ones probably having a greater effect than um, you know some of the first ones. So diabetes in specific cost the nation over $300 billion in healthcare bear bills and lost productivity every year. And they have this program, so this is Berkeley, so UCSF stands for University of California, San Francisco. They have this program called Agile Metabolic Health, and it's to revolutionize the patient experience uh, for millions of people with diabetes. And in specific, so you see a lot of these partnerships, if you're not familiar with Bay Area, a, a lot of these, you know, Cupertino's Apple and, you know, Stanford, Palo Alto, Mountain View is is um, Google, you know, they have headquarters there and a lot of them are within half hour drive. So say if you were to go from San Jose, which is basically Silicon Valley at the south of the Bay to Berkeley, that's within an hour too. So it's all these big cities with, um, you know, they're all working more or less like in, in um, their niches. You know, you're not gonna find that everybody does everything. This is from Stanford to Berkeley to, you know, um, 
you know, UCSF. So anyways, the Berkeley uh, UCSF led open platforms for power, powering science and so society initiative. And this is for people with multiple chronic diseases who count for 40% of the population. So I included some of the the names. So on this particular one, it was mostly Fernando Perez and Ida Sim and similar to that Stanford one. Uh, before. So what we see here is basically this is UCLA. So I live in San Diego, you know, so up the coast, you go to Los Angeles, and then, you know, there's uh, Pasadena, which is Caltech, and then you go up the coast further, and it's all the Bay Area, like the Berkeley, Stanford, uh, Apple, Google, you know, they're all up there. So with this specific one, it's actually, uh, it seems like a bigger study with AI, 83,000 surgical outcomes to advance training AI algorithms, with ne nearly 60,000 patients, you know, so it's, you know, AI is no longer a new thing or a, one of those things that, you know, people would research and, you know, there was some speculation to it. It's, it's like I said, especially with FDA approvals um, that it's, 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 you know, being used in healthcare uh, extensively. And then in November, 2023, AI model uh, to predict survival outcomes for patients with cancer. So this is carcinomas, uh, gliomas or brain tumors, those types of things. And epigenetics, which is methylation of the DNA, uh, these gene expression levels used to train and test AI, AI models. So there's, yes, and there's always going to be, you know, safety checks of using AI. What is the degree of the black box net? black box ness of what you're using in these specific things. And I thought a, a cool quote, quote with this is, it says, our research helps provide a roadmap for similar AI models that can be generated through publicly available lists of prognostic epigenetic factors, i.e. not just theirs. So, you know, this is, this is an interesting one. So if you've tuned into this channel before, it's all about applying quantum machine learning into medical applications and Chemical Q device is not the only company that does this. And in specific, uh, this quantum transfer learning model. So Penny Lane, say for instance, has like 28 different quantum machine learning demos. They're full uh, Python notebooks that you can run in Jupyter Lab or, you know, Jupyter Notebook. And the, the quantum transfer learning model is interesting because it runs both a deep learning neural network and your specific trainable quantum circuit. So what, that's represented in this B, so in this B portion right here. And it's, it's not typically as big as the deep learning neural network, um, but you can still see changes, significant changes by switching from one quantum algorithm to another. So that's what's represented in this in this portion here. It's it's pre-trained, you know, with um, you know, the ResNet and you know this convolutional neural network and say ImageNet, and you're taking those weights into it. Those are fixed, and then you're studying the quantum weights. So in other words, these parameters that get fine-tuned, and these these are in the form of qubit rotations. Okay, and so we'll get to that. You know, as far as what is a quantum bit. What is a rotation? What's a phase? You know, these types of things to, to use in medical. So in specific, so there's a ton of these up on GitHub. So I've seen them for, uh, you know, for BERT, you know, which is more for text and then a ton for images. And I took it pretty far going, you know, from a standard binary, you know, set of brain tumor or not, all the way up to 10 and 44 classes with the 10 having some very interesting results. And the way this one ran is you want to be aware of this is, you know, there are specific ratios that work best based on the model. So this particular model, you want twice as many qubits as number of classes of images. And it's not that hard, but you do have to understand the notebooks of what numbers to change in order to make the greatest effects. Now you can get by with running embed embeddings and you could do full variational algorithms as well with these and, you know, you don't necessarily have to train parameters. They're used to try to access these lower losses. And one of the studies that was done is basically to do some with ResNet and then basically three with ResNet and then one with the vision transformer, which is a transformer. And um, I'll have some results on this further, but it basically goes to show is that, you know, the way that these are coded is that it's a very practical thing. There are some issues with GPU usage with Python, or I'm sorry, PyTorch and TensorFlow currently. Um, you can use, say for instance, NumPy. A lot of times you can use, you can find neural networks on there, run pump uh, NumPy, get full GPU acceleration across uh, quantum plus classical algorithms. 
So here's an example. So I really like this diagram, and this is from uh, Shawar et al. And they, they were using Alzheimer's brain MRIs. And basically, you have your input, and it goes into, like I said, it goes into this classical deep learning, which is it, the parameters were learned from a, a pre-trained network, and then it goes into this quantum variational circuit. So we read circuits left to right, So and we read qubits starting at zero. So for instance, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, that's a four qubit circuit. The C4 represents the number of classical bits, which you need a classical bit uh, per, per, per qubit to measure. So those are the measurements on the right there. So typically you're going to come in with some type of elements, you know, so if it's the elements coming off of the, you know, the deep learning, I, and, you know, to, to set us initial states, I don't think that you would want to set initial states zero cat the whole time, because you want fluctuations, you want, you want to see the actual pixels, you know, uh, represented after dimension reduction in, in the circuit like that. So here's a standard embedding. So this Hadamard RY uh, with a fixed angle. So when you see pi over two, it's gonna be, this is embedding. So it takes the inputs. Um, so traditionally in images, like I said, like you have a specific you know, um, pixel and a lot of times a pixel goes to a qubit. And sometimes, you know, it's a little bit different but some models are like that. Uh, was there a question re regarding to this slide? Yes, so I was just looking at your quantum circuit. So what is this RY gate? Is it like rotation about only one of the axes by, by way? Yeah, so it's a fixed gate. So X, Y, and Z are 180 degrees about those respective axes. And then an RY, RX, RZ can either be an embedding gate, which has a fixed angle. So for instance, all of these, there's four qubits, you know, so if this isn't a GPU, they're simulated. So you have each of those four, and then when it, each of those, these are times. So they're all going to be at a certain state. They're all going to see the Hadamard gate, and then they're all going to see this RY at pi over two, and then it's going to turn the, the qubit at pi over two rotations. I see. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then... And I'll get to some more of these. And basically there's, you know, when you're, when you have trainable, i.e. what makes quantum machine learning, uh, quantum machine learning is that those angles, instead of being pi over two are now set to specific rotations and phase and rotation, they both mean the same thing. So keep that in mind. Mm. Now, a lot of these with classification, I haven't seen too much results. It's mostly be, been embeddings, you know, so it's embedding with quantum, um, you know, gates. And then also trainable gates, like so you have RY embeddings, and then you have RY trainable gates as well. And then these are entangling gates here too. So these are called C knots, and basically they're they they commute. So you have qubit zero to qubit one. These are you know essentially entangled. So that's what we mean by quantum entanglement is when you have a gate such as a C knot gate, and there's many other ones that do that too. And then, like I said before, so you're going to have your, uh, you're going to measure on poly Z, you know, for these. And then the output is either going to be zeros and ones, you know. So this is done in an iterative fashion in order to, you know, turn the this, it starts off classical uh, image. It turns into quantum states here, meaning that the qubit has a specific angle at a specific time. And then it goes, it gets measured and that, these zero, one, two, threes for classical, they turn back into binary if you're qubits. And so you have zero, one, zero, one, or zero, one for each specific one. So there's many times that it goes through. So you can see there's a specific quantum device that runs this. This is typically, you know, you have GPU, um, you have CPUs, um, you, you can, I, I haven't had too much success with TPUs, um, but basically, it's the only way to to use quantum machine learning these days for many, many years, probably over five years, is to actually take the benefits of the quantum algorithms, but work with it seamlessly in today's you know machine learning frameworks. So anyways, the, the end result is you get an answer. So these are two classes. So you see that they're using four qubits to two classes I mentioned before. And your answer is going to be demented, non-demented. So this is, you know, this is, you know, dementia. This is Alzheimer's, you know, similar to Parkinson's. Now, I mentioned this before, and I, I think this one is actually the convolutional neural network, which is uh, also a penny lane uh, demo, but it's an example. So each of these pixels 
is gets rotated at, in the angle embedding part of the, uh, of this and the you know it's not weights because you know trainable weights because those change over time it's the actual data that gets encoded from this classical to uh in in order to get it into a quantum state to do all this other stuff you know and then it's measured turns back into zeros and ones and this this goes on so the whole goal with this is to find the most efficient architectures in specific you want to try to work with quantum algorithms that are they can't be dequantized meaning that they can only be represented using you know penny lane or kiskit and you can't break them down any which way into a traditional algorithm right so that's what we mean by like you know we want to keep uh the quantum benefit as much as we can by using specific algorithms that that just you know can never be touched uh, traditionally, you know, without using quantum mechanics and quantum physics. So this is the Kiskit. So these are some of the gates that you can use. So this is taken from um, Composer and you could build these circuits. Um, you can't, like you can't do trainable parameters, those types of things, but if you just wanna do it for a paper and then just like you can specify th these are embedding gates or these are trainable gates, that's something that you could do. Now, this is the core essence of uh, quantum machine learning and, and is to have, you know, these qubits and say each qubit, it starts off at their zero degrees uh, radian or, or uh, turn with that. And when you see a layer of gates, meaning a, a vertical layer of gates, so when you see, you know, an RY embedding, the, it's going to... It, well, th that's actually based on the input data. So these would be more for, these are trainable parameters that the blue arrows, they change. It, it, the, the coordinates of the qubit are gonna change over time as it, and it's the same thing. You have mini batches, you have epochs, you know, so for a specific epoch, you'll have a certain configuration, but as the results get better, that was as a result of these specific four qubits all being in, in a more optimized, um, you know, rotations for all those. And we call this the block sphere. So the block sphere has, uh, you know, theta and, and psi here. And, you know, depending on the types of gates that you're using, you know, traditionally, if you're using just rotational R, Y, and Z, you just need a theta. But if you have, you know, multi in, entangling gates with some trainable parameters, you can start to tie into this theta, psi, and, and, you know, these three different angles, basically. So it's very, if you were to boil all this down, it's really not that complicated. It's just, you know, you might get confused between phase and rotations and these types of things. And, you know, it's basically getting this closer to a science that we can say like, okay, for sure, this number of angle embedding gates or for sure this number of trainable gates based on a specific data set. So where we see this in literature is all over, you know, so there's been so many different studies between COVID, arthritis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, brain tumors, and you could go through these. And like I said, the, the most common one uses is, is quantum transfer learning and a variational quantum circuit, meaning it's a quantum algorithm. And then the, you know, the parameters on it train, you know, so machine learning that type of thing. And you also see quantum convolutional neural network. And some of these are unique in that they do know how to program well with, uh, you know, QML. And they're just a little bit different than the, they're, you know, could, can be significantly different than some of these other ones. But it's worth to go through. And I would, I would base a lot of this more on their approach more than the disease, because yes, you know, images, you know, then you step up to medical images and then what type of medical images is it? But it's more important that, you know, that something is making sense, right? Like I, you studied the quantum transfer learning demo or the QCNN demo, you understand most of it, and then you can read their paper. And sometimes they can help you to further understand the demo, even past what Kiskit or Penny Lane has. And then these were a bunch of sets of experiments. And I broke them down basically, if you have variational, so the words variational, trainable, um, you know, uh, parameterize these types of things have to do, it means machine learning. And we're, if we're using it for quantum machine learning, then it's, it's likely going to be a rotational gate. So you see these first two are technically quantum machine learning algorithms. 
And the issue that is run into here is once you get up to thousands of images on a single GPU, and um, it's actually slower to run on an A100 versus a V100, which is actually the next tier down. And it's still running a deep learning neural network. You know, it's just a big demo, right? So 16 gigs, you know, you just don't, and you get up to 20 qubits, you're gonna be pressed for RAM, you know, these compute, compute resources for sure. And the two biggest results from this is the 11% increase of using an embedding quantum algorithm versus uh, a, no, no circuit at all in, a, in an analogous Stanford uh, model that, that the quantum model was based on. And then the 44 classes that, that poses additional um, you know, complexities. It's the biggest thing that bogs down is the number of, it's the data set size, you know, and the neural network size or ResNet 18 is, is not huge, but it's, it's gonna be bigger than many of the other quantum circuits. And then, so what you can do with this, so when I said 10 class was the best is because as I increased the number of trainable parameters, and we're talking about machine learning, is that that had the biggest impact on the best data set. And when I said best data set, I mean the, the data set, this 10 class data set that has a good representation in, in the training set of those specific uh, tumor types. So if you have glioma, meningioma, and you only have like 50 images in there to train off of, and you're testing 200, that's that's not gonna have good results. So anyways, it was a good data set. And basically with this study showing that eight layers of trainable gates assisted having this 10 class, you know, 3,500 images, um, you know, to get the better results. So if you study a lot of this is, you're gonna wind up here, okay? So it's difficult and challenging to, um, to do everything on your own when you're designing quantum algorithms. And you have to get familiar with the different models because some models say, for instance, that you can only run with a certain type of template as opposed to using uh, uh, QML.ry, you know, like the basic one based on the inputs and other, other things going on. So like I said, this is, you have to get very familiar with this, especially with embeddings. Uh, most of it for image classification is angle embedding. And there's high hopes for IQP embedding. You'll see in literature, I haven't seen too much. I've tested it a number of times and you know, basically the best I could get is it just didn't help at all. This co-embedding I'm gonna be featuring uh, here more. And I've used a lot these random layers, strongly entangling layers and simplified two design. They all have their quirks and basic entangling layers. These four I've used a lot, especially uh, a little less of the simplified two design, but they all have their quirks, you know? So the main thing is they're set up by repetitions, right? So when you see a repeat unit in these, so reps like it, in the code, it'll come out as like reps equals one. Say for instance, in random layers, this is two reps, okay? And strongly entangling layers, this is two reps. And you can change, you know, you could take out in some of these, the random layers, I know for sure, because I've done it, you can take out the entangling gates and just have rotational gates uh, that are trainable. And they all, you know, say for instance, you can change from an X basis to a Y basis to a Z basis. And they're, they're convenient to use. And, um, you know, it's probably better to use something like that in literature that's like more trusted by more researchers as opposed to something that is just, you're cooking up uh, fresh variational circuits all the time, right? So you say, I use strongly entangling layers, you know, whatever repetitions, and this is the one that's in the template page here. So these are templates. And then the basis state preparation, this is what goes into the quantum circuit. So remember, in most of these cases, you're gonna be using some classical data and then, it's it you know it needs to be embedded, but it also needs to be set to a certain uh, state um, a lot of times. So say if you want it at this sp specific, it says a, a basis state using a sequence of poly X gates. You know which rotation of the qubit do you want to start at? Okay, and then here's more uh, templates too. And I would if you're just getting started with this, I would especially spend a ton of time, especially on the penny lane it's actually called the Xanadu Discussion Forum. And, you know, there's issues with modern state preparation that I've seen on, on it. And Qtris state preparation is for Qtris. They actually did a post on this. This is like a qubit alternative, but 
we can go as high as we want with simulators with, uh, um, you know, QDIDs basically. And here we go, arbitrary state uh, preparation. You could set, you know, you could set it how you want. So this is all fine and dandy until it doesn't work. And then you have to go to the discussion forums. So it's gonna take some time because you get you have to get familiar and you have to get some wins in. So basically like, okay, you know, find a demo that works, work with it, modify it, show that you know what, what it's doing. And, um, you know, it just takes time, right? Because there's different quirks as far as, like I said, the PyTorch, um, you know, uh, TensorFlow isn't advertised that it doesn't work with GPUs, but that's the case. So if you want to do something cool, you kind of have to use NumPy. And you can find NumPy neural networks, you know, on, on GitHub, these types of things. So matrix product state and tree tensor networks, these are kind of like a lot of people in industry are uh, pinning their hopes on using these with GPUs because although they're approximate, so they're not state vectors, they're approximate solutions, you can scale um, well with these. And NVIDIA, and I'll show you too, is scaled with you know hundreds, if not thousands of qubits. And I don't believe that's a full quantum machine learning workflow with images, you know, a bunch of medical data, but it's, it's possible to do. And these are other familiar algorithms. So quantum phase estimation finds the angles of the quantum state transformation eigenvalues. And you could just see yourself like, you know, you're, you're a programmer, you've done this in deep learning, or, you know, you're doing it well with quantum. Quantum Mon Monte Carlo, you hear about a lot. So these are templates and they can a lot of times be modified. So it's not always like you just can only use a quantum Monte, quantum Monte Carlo. Um, same thing, quantum Fourier transform. These likely have a lot of knobs to turn. Quantum singular value transform. This one too, you'll hear about. And Hil Hilbert Schmidt, you'll hear about too. So here's Kiskit. And Kiskit, you know, this is the heart of it. If you're, I, you know, I get questions in my inbox, like, you know, what exactly should we do? And obviously the answer is quantum machine learning, because that's what I do. But it's for a reason. It's just because like people just like they'll hunker down and they'll just run experiments all night, you know, or late into the night, these types of things. And if, if you want to program, you know, you have to get familiar with what's out there. So these are all feature maps, meaning they're, they're embeddings, these first three. And then you get into Grover operator, which you hear about a lot. And this is, you know, um, you know, thought to be like, you know, a key algorithm amplifies that amplitude of the solution state, suppresses amplitudes of non-solution states for that specific one. And then, um, so you get the poly two design efficiently, or it's actually efficiently represents pairwise correlations. And then phase Oracle modifies the phase of certain uh, quantum states. So again, like this isn't meant to be rocket science and I don't think it's at that level, but like you, you, you know, you have to understand the basics is basically you have to convert classical data into some form of rotation. If it's the inputs that themselves that are going into the embedding layer in the quantum circuit, these quantum states, or they, the uh, angles get turned over time, i.e. quantum machine learning. And then here's the IQP circuit. There's no difference between what's in color, what's in not. Just some of the Kiskit pages are in, in color and some are not. And, you know, so like the penny lane ones, they're highly uh, adjustable. And there's a, a lot of support behind Kiskit as far as running these algorithms. And I know people that, you know, have gone through schools, uh, these types of things. And I've used efficient SU2. So these particular ones, you know, some of these are going to be, um, you know, controlled knots are, are, are typically not trainable, uh, but the Y gates is probably going to be, um, actually the RX theta, when you see thetas, those are typically trainable. And when you see in literature a lot, you'll either see low X, lowercase X, and that's more inputs, so that's more embedding. And then a theta is, is the uh, trainable parameter, i.e. quantum machine learning that gets updated over time. Embeddings are very, very important. If you don't have a good quantum embedding, the trainable algorithm is not gonna do well, no matter how you know you adjust things. You know, So Kiskit, you're working with Z feature map, ZZ feature map, these, these types of things. Real amplitudes I've used a lot, and I'll change repetitions and Sometimes you just got to go with whatever works. If you're looking to get top accuracy, increase the repetition, decrease the repetition, double the circuit size, half the circuit size, you, you have to experiment with it uh, a lot of times. 
And these other ones, you know, here about here's the COA here as well, the COA onsets, and I'm going to be going over those as, as well there too. Now, here's the issue is basically in uh, quantum machine learning, which CPUs and GPUs is your, you know, you have the limitations of classical processing, but there's three techniques, circuit cutting, which Penny Lane uses. Um, and I think, I believe, yeah, I'm pretty sure Kiskit used it too. Tensor networks, which I mentioned before, and, and neural networks. I just ran a, a slew of these parallel quantum algorithms to get the you know higher efficiency with more parallel algorithms, i.e. faster to um, ideal solution. And what happens is is basically you get more and more qubits, and then this you know this n goes uh, higher and higher. So if it's qubits, it, you know it's very similar to what happens uh, classically. So we're effectively taking the best parts of running quantum algorithms, but with GPUs. And we, we can't get rid of this issue. However, with the other three that are addressing it, it, it makes it, um, it, it, it looks pretty bright, especially you know, with a lot of these. Now, tensor networks, now, if you get started in anything that's like GPU based in, in quantum machine learning or quantum computing, NVIDIA has done a lot of experiments. So they got up to 1600 qubits. And I actually was watching a video and they said they got up to tens of thousands of qubits. And these, I don't believe are quantum machine learning workflows, but more proof of concepts that you, for a given number of GPUs as you can get up to these qubits. And these are typically done with tensor networks. So I've seen some literature with it and it was a classification classification problem with BMW, uh, this Max Planck uh, Institute. And they said the res results weren't awesome. Um, the other thing is it's an approximate solution. So it's not an exact state vector algorithm like what you would write in a Qiskit composer or you know many of the penny lane circuits that you know there's these TTNs and the MPSs, those are the two main ones that you'll find. Um, you have to use them in a certain way. And you know, a sandbox AQ, I had I have quotes in, in previous discussions, they basically say, you know we're just going to use GPUs with, with quantum algorithms. We don't, we, we don't need anything else. So Sandbox AQ is saying 32 of these N NVIDIA H100s, which will probably get upgraded to H200s, I think in February, something like that. First quarter, um, NVIDIA has new GPUs coming out to solve a lot of these uh, challenging problems. And you kind of get, you know, as a smaller researcher, you have high hopes uh, because a lot of these bigger projects, they just do these huge, you know, proof of concepts. We can do COA algorithm, 129 qubits. That's the experiment. And we don't hear too much more than that. But there's so much research to do. Um, and if you're just getting started, I would recommend benchmarking devices because that'll get you in the swing of things, i.e. finding out how, how fast each particular device is that you can use, which ones you, which ones work, which ones don't work. And then you can move on to parameter studies. And then you want to start increasing the, the types of comparisons. So you're not just doing a comparison um, within itself. You're doing comparisons to other studies and what other people have done too. So again, so these things with tensor networks, efficiency, um, and this this is huge. So having access to Hilbert space, which is you know this qubit representation, uh, the block sphere that grows exponentially with the number of qubits, right? So you're losing some things, you know, with the approximate solutions, but you're also having access, I, I think, in a single uh, single circuit to high qubits is typically what happens. Um, which you know I know you can use for classifications. It, it just depends on how the good the results will be. Um, so a lot of these things you'll see scaling exponentially. And then I've been focusing on these parallel quantum circuits because they are exact solutions, uh, quantum state vectors. And then in specific, on the left one is a 10 qubit circuit. And just using two of those, I had a 20% increase in training loss efficiency and about 15% validation loss. In the middle one, this four four qubit one compared to a 16 qubit circuit, actually got better, a lower loss, uh, runtime, and especially RAM. The RAM in a 16 qubit circuit compared to these other small ones, like anything, you know, basically under 16 or maybe like 14 and below. The RAM spike, if you if you get up in qubits in the simulators is is, is quite high. And um, the last one is, is another, uh, you know, basically study showing that with a single qubit, I could get perfect loss, 100% accuracy, and it's, it's hard, 
there's a balance between efficiency. So if you run a single circuit for many, many epochs, you can get to a solution in this demo that's similar to this. But a lot of times, especially for a double uh, quantum uh, a circuit in parallel, meaning two quantum circuits in parallel, the efficiency is better to run in parallel than to run more epochs. So the processing is, is more based on uh, being focused on the algorithm as opposed to the whole uh, quantum machine learning workflow. So these are promising. Now, are there any questions at this point? So this is a big study here. And so this is basically Xanadu. So for those that don't know, so Xanadu owns PennyLane. PennyLane is the quantum machine learning framework similar to IBM uh, operating Qiskit is what happens here. So what they did is basically you're trying to run 129 qubits and um, the next one is basically, it seemed like three or four experiments with this and then 62 qubit for optimization and then the final results. So this was in a paper. So this is uh, uh, Lo uh, and uh, Medvedev at Al. And you'll see some of these people too, and a lot of them, you know, they're on discussion forum. So, um, you know, you might see them there too. So Thomas Bromley is the one that wrote the, the PyTorch parallel quantum circuits. So, you know, there's a, there's, um, you know, they're, they're good at what they do basically. So, so this is the code. So the code is available on GitHub. And what's unique about this is, is QML.wirecut. And you usually have to, you'll call something else before defining this function. And the QML.wirecut is basically um, allows this to run, uh, you know, at higher qubits by taking these pieces, either you can cut by qubits or you can cut by layers, processing all those and then putting them all back together. So this is, this is believed to be an effective technique. And just like with anything, you know, there's, there's limits maybe based on our intellect or what we've run in the, in the past, but um, it's worth checking out because it's, it's one of the bigger ones. And another good one is uh, that I think should have some notebooks up or is the Brookhaven. So nurse N E R S C is uh, uh, houses. I think this is at Berkeley lab, the uh, Pearl mutter supercomputer and uh, you know, Xanadu and other researchers had access to the supercomputer to run this 129 qubit circuit that's cut into pieces. Um, you know, so that's, and you'll see different camps too, right? So this is the camp just that I'm in as we can go really far with GPUs. And um, I would say that this is uh, what, what was being accomplished here. So here's the two other experiments of variational energy calculation. So basically um, increasing qubits, uh, not going at exponentially in, in time, right? So, uh, you know, that, that's the key with these is, like I said, if you run a 16-qubit circuit compared to four four qubit circuits, the RAM is going to be so much bigger, and especially um, especially the RAM, but, you know, the, the runtime too. And then, so you see parameter optimization on 62 qubits. So this is another step that they took, you know, with COA, this algorithm. And then here's another, so there's 79 qubit. So you look at the axes, so it's based on number of nodes. Um, and you'll see that they did report that the speed up uh, does kind of tail off a little bit here, going up to 32 uh, GPU nodes. Um, but it... You know, and all these things, these things have kind of worked like parallel processing has worked for classical. So it's like at the bare minimum, you know, what can, what can be the, you know, the best impact. And it's, you know, it's likely going to help uh, quantum circuit processing with these, uh, those three methods. And then, so basically, if you're just really starting off with this is you have some bits for the notebook, you have some bits for simulating qubits and the bits are, are instructed to behave according to quantum mechanics to make quantum bits or these simulated qubits. And this is where the um, you know, perspective advantage would be as you have you know, these certain quantum algorithms that they can't be dequantized or they can't be turned back into traditional algorithms. They're unique. Um, you know, that's just that's you know, that's that's the big goal right there. And they don't have noise, you're running in a classical environment. So the big thing with this, um, 
you don't actually need extreme uh, processing to do these. Like I could run that single qubit at 320 parallel algorithms at like two, basically baseline RAM, like 2.3 gig gigabytes, which is, is hardly nothing. And a lot of that's other processes in the notebooks. So um, the key thing with this is it's very, everything's analogous to, to classical. And in fact, if you lined up the nodes on like a, a neural network, you never heard of wide neural networks, right? They're always deep because there's issues with inputs like regular deep learning is you typically have a bunch of layers, right? So this specific layer has these whatever nodes, but you're not going um, wide. So you're not going like increasing the input size, you know, drastically. And it's the same thing of doing this, running quantum algorithms and, and classical processing. And basically, so the thing to focus up, up here is I made this little diagram is you have a cost of converting classical data into quantum states. And this is seen in embedding. And then you also have some costs. I don't think it's nearly as much, but measurements. So once the quantum states, you know, whatever you want to do with them, you know, embed, train, you have to measure them or turn them back into bits. So those are downs. And the upside with this is basically um, quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, compute benefits that are, you know, make sense, right? So you're not spending all the cost on, you know, the embedding and then, you know, the, the performance. So I really think it'll come down to the specific quantum algorithms that have the, the best, you know, um, better performance than traditional methods and can't be dequantized. And these, there's so many different options, but I've done a bunch with, you know, quantum embeddings in Hilbert space with trainable parameters, with entanglement, other specific quantum processes, other algorithms. And people get fancy with it all, but you have to think about you know, what you're doing. And so if you want to claim a quantum be benefit running on GPUs, and many you know, people in industry says, you know, immediate profit using these techniques, or you know, this is we don't, we're only going to use GPUs, you have to keep these things in mind. And I think a lot of the, the academic papers they don't understand these things. They're good with the medical data, um, but it's just, you know, it's not there yet for them as far as, we don't need to run so many of these layers of entangling gates if it's not helping the classification, that type of stuff. And like I said, so I hinted on this a little bit before. So doubling a circuit, having a circuit, symmetry with a circuit. So symmetry would be like their mirror images. So if you have a specific circuit, and make another one, but have it mirror the left half of what the circuit looks on, uh, drawn. And you could do qubit adjustments, these types of things, you know, adding, removing layers. It is good to experiment. So the last part here is visualizing quantum circuits could be its own subsection of, of quantum computing. And I think a, a lot of other people get tripped up with it because Sometimes you have to put it into very simple terms as opposed to using templates and these types of things. But these specific notebooks help to get started. So Google Circ is for Google quantum uh, circuits. If you want to use Google for quantum machine learning, you use TensorFlow Quantum. Qiskit, you can do uh, both. And Penny Lane in specific, you could do a lot with quantum machine learning. And then, so this is basically, you can also analyze too. So in specific, so CERC, you, you have to get into these moments and these types of things. But anyways, you can get um, some stats on it. The Qiskit, and if you're familiar with this, circuit.width.depth.size, you can get you know um, even more information than what's shown there. And the QML.specs for Penny Lane, I've had issues with sometimes, like, again, I think it needs to be in a specific format that doesn't always coincide with what you're running in a demo, but it gives you all this stuff, um, you know, number of trainable parameters, those types of things. And this is basically the Qiskit version of what's going on. Um, and I'm, I think this is based on map, I want to say matplotlib, one, one of those. And anyways, you could do things with the backgrounds and you can change colors. Now, what it's called here is basically the qubit wires. They have a specific name for that. I set to light green. And um, you, could, you could do a lot of different modifications. So the big ones is the <clears throat> output equals text is usually the most compatible. So if you're trying to just get something that looks like something, um, that's that. The latex one is slower, and I've had issues with compatibility. 
but you can see it's it's a nice looking circuit right there. So you know you have to use these in literature. You know what you're going off with in your own medical studies there too. Are there any questions? Uh, Kevin, I have one question, uh, which was related to tensor networks that you spoke of. I couldn't hear that right. Um, the Max Planck classification that um, that you spoke of uh, was was the result uh, for classification very good through tensor networks or was not really good. I, no. I couldn't hear that right. No, it's a Nature paper, so I, I've actually read it and I've reported on it previously, and it's very well done, I would say. And I don't know if the issue was just the nature of the t tensor network being more proximate than state vectors. And they, the Max Planck, I think the data set was these welding, or actually it was probably from BMW. Um, they were welding Im uh, images and they had to classify if it was a, say for instance, like a stress uh, fracture or something like that. But yeah, they did highlight at the end, it, it's a, you learn a ton about tensor networks, but you know, it did say that you know, um, the, the results weren't as, as good as they wanted to be. It weren't. Oh, okay. Got yeah. Thanks, thanks. Any other questions? Any questions regarding any specific slides? And, you know, anybody could do this. You know, if you, you know, it's going to take months. Right. So if you're coming from deep learning, I would say shave some time off that. The quantum algorithms, unless you're really focusing on quantum algorithms in the research, in, in the notebooks and that type of stuff, is um, you have to understand machine learning. So I'd go to some, you know, machine learning talks and AI, go to deeplearning.ai. You know, you have to know epochs, um, you have to know batch size, you know, all these types of things. Um you have to be able to visualize what's going on. So if you have like a hundred images and the batch size is five, it's a hundred divided by five is the number of mini batches that equals uh, an epoch. So, you know, a, a specific epoch in its own is not, um, that's very rare to run all of your data all at the same time that I've seen. And typically you're running it in small little batches and you're also uh, adjusting those parameters, you know, the trainable weights inside these mini batches before you, the that epoch is reported uh, for that specific one. But like, again, like I, you know, I get questions in my inbox and, you know, obviously the answer is quantum machine learning. I mean, just on the sheer basis of uh, price availability, you know, all of these things, I was running on high RAM CPUs for all the parallel circuits. Uh, number one, because I couldn't because of the PyTorch Penny Lane GPU issue that there is today. Um, but that's like two cents an hour. It, it's 20 credits per hour. And then it's, you know, it, it winds up to be like basically two pennies in an hour. And, there, you know, so it's, it's really cheap. And as long as you're not getting super high in qubits and super wide in depth, especially with qubits, um, are just super, you know, extended with that, that, you know, a lot of these, you know, just find the good demos, quantum transfer learning, quantum convolutional neural networks. I put up a poll and people said that besides neural networks was number one for quantum, you know, running quantum circuits in them, uh, generalizing data with uh, generalization, which is a machine learning ter term uh, with few training data is another uh, demo that Penningly has. And these are based on, you know, many years of research. So this is not necessarily a new field. Any other questions? I saw some people kind of hop on here. And the, the whole key with this all is like, if people succeed in deep learning, working at like hugging face and, you know, say for instance, like if, uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow, it's because they didn't give up. And, you know, you have to be pretty content. You have to be used to always having to get the next better answer, that type of stuff. And it's the same thing with uh, running quantum algorithms within these frameworks. So, but I would definitely kind of live on the Penny Lane discussion forum for a while. The the quantum machine learning stuff, I think is getting bigger on Qiskit. 
um, but it's it's not like the sole objective. And uh, it's a little bit harder to kind of, you know, read other po people's posts and, you know, see what they're doing or help them out, those types of things. So any other questions? So obviously this, this is definitely machine learning and then this is definitely quantum algorithms, you know, and you're going to be using at some point GPUs and, you know, advanced, you know, devices, even if you're circuit cutting or parallel circuits or who knows, maybe you won't, but in many cases it's synonymous to run quantum algorithms with, you know, uh, a little bit higher RAM spec than, than classical machine learning. And I'd be interested, you know, as far as ever, everybody's research there too, you know, with QML and, um, you know, what's giving you an issue? Is it the algorithms? Is it the notebooks? Are you good with deep learning, machine learning? Have you run, you know, many other types of uh, ML models? And there's a specific things, because I, I think the, the key differenti differentiator, I actually have a slide on this. I didn't include it on this one is, if you look at the nodes on a deep learning neural network and you look at a, a quantum circuit, which com comprises this algorithm, it's just drawn out, it's the circuit, it's very similar, right? So four qubits, four nodes, you know, both of them. And then they, you know, they're both gonna have issues going wide, you know, so more and more nodes. Um, so, and again, it's not called wide neural, neural networks, they're called deep neural networks. And this is the same thing that you could do with quantum algorithms is you can go, you know, pretty um, um, deep with the number of, you know, embeddings or uh, layers or the number of trainable uh, layers there too. And then, you know, you know, as far as medical data goes there too, is you, you have access to all these different data sets. I've used several from Kaggle and um, they're de-identified, so they won't say your name on them, or they won't say the patient's name, and you know they're generally good to use. And stepping up from there to other bigger organizations that you might have genomics data and all this other type of stuff they're giving you access to, um, it's good to start off with something simple. So start off with just Kaggle, you know, data sets, and uh, they're mostly good. I mean, it's certain ones you don't if you're looking at brain images you want all to be a certain you know axial view you know like you know a, a top section of the head you don't want because if they're in the same folder or directory you're in training you don't want like sagittal views and all these other ones right because it's not it's not uh, giving the uh, computer the correct thing to train off of you know it, it might see some of those and uh, but typically you would have them in different folders for different sections of the head, right? But there are some out there like that that have a mixture of different, you know, views of the of the brain. And, you know, as far as running these with a quantum transfer learning model, the two big issues um, or three, you know, is going to be the data set size. So number of images, if you get into thousands of images, the base one is only 400, right? So it's gonna take some time if you're using a GPU that's meant for the deep learning part. And you know the other parts is the quantum circuit. If you get too big with it, especially if you get like 20 qubits, you can't do much on the trainable end of, the, of things um, given that. But the question that was asked before, you know, tensor networks, people really wanna use them. They're, um, you know, uh, thought to be very scare, uh, scalable. And I would say, yeah, I mean, it's just like the thing that gets left out in all this is anybody can run these experiments if you have some practice and your data, like your tables <clears throat> and all these charts have a lot of impact, um, you know, especially if you keep doing them as opposed to like a single big study that just ran off the cuff at a supercomputer. And I, I'm not saying anybody did that, but you know, your continuous, um, growth and uh, you know, your understanding of the material gets better and hopefully your results get better too because you're able to see things that kind of work better as you get better, right? So <clears throat> that's, the, that's the keys, right? Like don't give up, uh, show your work. Um, I would always show notebooks. 
So it's better to find out. <laughs> it's a lot of research that just dies because nobody really, you know, it, it takes a lot to really believe in somebody's work to the point of using it as your own. But if you keep developing it, put your notebooks up, um, especially at this stage. Any other questions? So anybody that we haven't heard from? So uh, Edwidge or Frida? And then if not, uh, Caval or Diego? And it, it's not an emerging field. Like this has been around for a while. The quantum transfer learning demo is 2019. And that's probably the most interesting one out of there because it uses a big, you know, and you can change the neural network from ResNets uh, to 34, from 18 to 34 to 50. I've used all those. Um, you just have to change. It's one other part in the notebook. It'll be like, if it starts off at, if you search that notebook, it says 512. That's for the ResNet 18. If it says, uh, I think it's 2048 is most of the other ones. Like a, uh, the ResNet 34, there'll be a thing in the notebook and you have to change that value to that. And you also have to change uh, classes. So if you're giving it a certain number of directories, you have to change that too. And I have the notebooks up. So if you, if you run that demo, but yeah, it's not an emerging field at all. You know, it just with sandbox with all this stuff and uh, Terra quantum AG, a and I think they're Switzerland. They said that they can experience immediate financial impact using, you know, GPUs with uh, quantum algorithms. So, you know, Google Bard, they say they're using QML. Um, there's, there's a lot of, uh, so, Sandbox AQ with uh, Sanofi or uh, AstraZeneca for biotech. And, you know, they're saying like, you know, for big implications for, um, you know, uh, to help disease get better, right? These quantum algorithms, no matter, matter where you're running them, if you're running them correctly and it's not using too much um, compute for embedding and measurement, then in theory, you know, that's going to be the um, a driver. You know, there it's access to algorithms you don't have if you don't use Qiskit or Penny Lane, you can't get get to the quantum algorithms. They're, you know, I think probably most are deep. You can't dequantize them, right? Unless it's like a C not gate, and that's like that's a, or I'm sorry, it's a um, an X gate, and that's the same as a a bit flip for classical too. But it, I'll have to double check that. Um, any other questions? So yeah, and there was a comment here too. It says, uh, thanks so much for this. I, I got great insights and inspiration. I appreciate the feedback. And, um, you know, if you get, if you're in deep learning, I, it's just such a, a a smaller hurdle to to climb, I think. Like, you know, say if you see the algorithm, just keep it. And then using your own intuition, change learning rate, change batch size, you know, change change the normal things that you do in machine learning. Um, but yeah, it's all, you know, as far as the, the you know, I put a, up a, a survey this week and that number one was neural networks using, using in specific quantum circuits in inside torch.nn.module, you know, that's, that's the main thing to, to get into neural networks. Um, that was the number one thing. And the number two thing was generalization with few training data. And I think the other two um, embeddings with trainable parameters is huge. If you're not using the correct embedding and there's, you know, there's many they tell you in literature, just try try running Hadamard plus rotational gates. And then here's a good experiment. Run a Hadamard layer, rotational gate. Um, you know, these are all embedding gates for rotational, uh, like say for instance, an RY. Run like 10 layers of those. So one experiment has H, R, Y. One experiment has H and then two RYs. And then, um, you know, just run rotational gates on their own. And I, I got more consistent results on, on a model just running RY embedding, RY embedding, you know, uh, for a certain number, like eight. And, you know, it's not always the case where the literature, you, you know, you have to test things experimentally and then you go back and forth to so check literature. You know, does that sound right? Why is it not? You know, those types of things too. Awesome. So uh, it was it An had a, a comment here? I appreciate the the feedback. It says my research is on quantum hardware 
algorithms, okay? Um, they're basically, would you be more than happy to discuss further? Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you just have to um, keep going with it. But I would say, you know, finding these very specific algorithms that'll work on ha hardware for the next five years or say, you know, you can do, you could feed into machine learning, but it'll never be like, you know, QML with GPUs. It's all important, right? Because it, if it helps out in one step and it lightens the load for the rest of the QML, we're talking like hardware in, in some distant future, you know, you could do it. So <clears throat> yeah, and um, the, the main thing, I don't know if I included this or not, I think it's in one of the slides, is every classical algorithm you can simulate like on CPUs and GPUs, uh, classically. So that's exactly what's going on here in all these slides. But not every classical algorithm, um, but not every quantum algorithm can be simulated, um, you know, classically so, or, or traditionally. And you always have to be careful, like you try to use the words traditional or conventional when you're talking about quantum inspired machine learning, as opposed to classically, right? Because everything's technically classical. So yeah, it, it's all important. And I, I see the greatest upside. So say you have a working technology and then you want to keep making modifications to it and you have results. So I ran a bunch of these parallel algorithms and like the stars kind of collided on some of these experiments as far as the data set was hard, but it wasn't so hard that I, I couldn't, you know, distinguish between, um, you know, changing to better algorithm. So, you know, you just it's more it's more important from to, in my perspective to get the good working results today and say for instance if hardware comes around in five years and then you know you could run a, a leg of the uh qml you know uh workflow on the quantum hardware all of the works you've already done with quantum algorithms have been done on gpus and cpus so that that's where i'm at and i I'm under the conviction that it'll go very far with GPUs. And even if you're, you know, like in your case, if you're using it for different purposes, you know, you're studying it to that point. And I'm sure you do use simulators all the time um, in order for it to fit in the future. So if you're happy doing that, um, you know, that's totally up to you. Yeah. So yeah, it's a very broad field too, and you'll you'll see this. And because there's classification for images, which is probably one of the biggest cases out there in, in academic literature with medical data. You know that it's huge. And um, there was a question about the tensor networks. And if you have any questions about circuit cutting or um, you know running algorithms uh, in neural networks or parallel, you can ask that too. But you know, it's just. Uh, it, it seems like there's a lot of upside because, you know, there, it takes the intellect behind it to, to run the best circuit cutting experiment or, you know, which per, how many parallel algorithms should I run in parallel without losing the efficiency of, of the single one. So the single one actually had better efficiency than say four, five, six, seven, eight, but or, I'm sorry, it's five, six, seven, eight, but at two, three and, and four, uh, it's actually more efficient to run in parallel with a double parallel algorithm as opposed to running a single one. So I, I'm talking about loss efficiency. So for a certain loss at a specific time, how low is it? So time and loss, you want, um, they're, they run together. So basically the lower, the better. So those types of things. But if you develop these correlations and then then you have to like scale up to other data sets and, and do things like this too. Um, but you really want to get to that point where you're getting awesome results somehow within the next, you know, three or six months. And that's probably going to be harder, you know, on other things besides GPUs and, and CPUs. So I, I think that's the thing, but like I said, if you're, if you're paid for five years and, you know, uh, they're happy and you're happy and, and you're doing these things and, you know, we'll, we'll get applications and hardware, I think, but it's going to, it's going to be a while, especially for, to, you know, impact uh, QML to some extent. All right. Any other questions? Appreciate everybody coming on.
Thanks, Kevin. Awesome. Um, so yeah, this has been discussion 118. Uh, this is Thursday, January 31st or 18th, uh, 2024 for QML algorithms for medical school research, you know, so the time is coming and the time has come. And especially with the embracing of AI, um, I wish everybody, you know, good rest of the night and have a productive rest of the week. Take care, everybody.